Thanks for joining me. The Princess Victoria disaster of January the 31st, 1953, was and remains Northern Ireland's worst maritime disaster. It was a terrible afternoon in the North Channel that brought anxiety, grief and disbelief particularly to the port towns of Larne and Stranraer. It's a historical event now, but there is still a rawness to it, because sufficient history has not passed to make the victims of this disaster anonymous. The impact on so many families was scarcely credible, and in 1953, there was a sense of disbelief that the passenger ferry Princess Victoria, so familiar on that North Channel route and so familiar in the Port of Larne, should be at the full mercy of the elements and should sink so close to our coast. In 1989, as a young reporter with the Lauren Times newspaper, I was tasked to produce a feature article on the Princess Victoria for the 36th anniversary of the disaster. And an appeal was put in the paper for uh, information for people to come forward with their memories. The response was very considerable and it resulted in a three-page feature in the paper at that time. I still have a copy of it today, uh, the day the Princess Victoria went down. And there were lots of stories and uh, lots of information that came from people at that particular time. So I think it's important to uh, recount some of those stories, everyday stories in many ways, of an extraordinary Margaret Martin and catastrophic was 18 event. years old and was at the matinee at the pictures in Lauren that afternoon. When she and her sister came out, they heard people saying that the ferry was down. At first, I thought that when they said the ferry was down, they meant the ferry over to Island McGee. Then we found out it was the Princess Victoria and everyone seemed to panic. I was supposed to be going out to a dance that night but that was out of the question. My uncle Hugh Brennan was on the ship. We found out on the Sunday that his body had been found. He was a very nice person, my favourite uncle, and he was well liked in the town. Eileen Gray of Island McGee recalled a Sunday school party at Second Island McGee Presbyterian Church that fateful day. The wind was so fierce that as the little tots arrived and tried to make for the door of the hall, it blew them up against the rough pebble dash wall and they were frightened and crying. Later that afternoon, we knew the Princess Victoria was in trouble. We learned by a phone call that my mother's brother was on board. He was James Kerr, a merchant navy master mariner, and was coming home for a few days after having left his ship in Glasgow. His wife Margaret was able to tune her wireless set into the short wave band and hear all that was going on between the rescue ships. As it turned out, Kerr helped to save the lives of 30 others while in a lifeboat which was still tied to the boat and would have been dragged down when the ship went to the bottom. He realised the need to cut the rope. George McKinley was playing football for Kent United in the town park that day. There were gales and blustery showers and the referee had to call the match off after 10 minutes. It was a terrible day, he said. Through conducting those and subsequent interviews over the years, I really had a strong sense of the disbelief which people felt at the time. It was such a shock that this modern vessel uh, had got into trouble at sea and then had been lost at sea. And there was that strong sense of disbelief uh, that this could happen in 1953 and it could happen to the Princess Victoria 
and to the people of Larn and Stranraer who were involved in the crews of both the Princess Victoria and the Princess Margaret whose crew were also on the ship. They were coming back uh, to Larn because the Princess Margaret was being uh, refurbished. So that sense of disbelief and shock has always stayed with me from talking to uh, a number of those people I interviewed, some of whom have, have passed away subsequently, of course, over the years in between. What did happen that day? Well, a storm was forecast and was anticipated, and the conditions in Loch Ryan on the morning of January 31st, 1953, uh, showed the signs that the storm had arrived. But it, it was not a, a situation that caused undue concern to the captain and crew. They had sailed, they believed, through worse. Um, and the ship uh, was determined to sail on her course that day. Um, and she set sail uh, from the Loch Ryan. One minor incident was that the... Uh, crane was not uh, operating very well. A car which had uh, been unable to be loaded onto the vessel had to remain on the port side uh, because of that, for example. But the ship made its way uh, along Loch Ryan, out to the mouth of Loch Ryan, and once it had emerged into the North Channel from Loch Ryan, that's when things started uh, to go wrong. Uh, we know from some of the accounts of um, crew members uh, what transpired then, what the situation was. And um, able seaman Malcolm McKinnon, uh, for example, he said uh, that, that when they emerged in the mouth, out of the mouth of Loch uh, Ryan into the North Channel, we turned around the lower buoy for our course to Larne. The seas seemed mountainous. When the boy was on our port quarter, the ship shipped a heavy sea over the starboard quarter and stern. And lighthouse keeper George Sutherland at Corswell Point uh, also gave an account of his view of the early stage of this ill-fated voyage by the Princess Victoria. He said that soon after I sighted her, she commenced to turn to the north or northeast, and as she came around, her bow lifted. She appeared to be hit by a heavy sea on the starboard side. Her bow lifted high in the air. She disappeared into the haze, heading east. I got the impression that she was turning round, possibly to re-enter the loch. The weather continued to get worse. When she was out of sight, she seemed to be on a line between Corswell Point and just north of Ballantrae, and appeared to be upright. I did not see the vessel again. I had the impression that the ship was trying to come around into the wind. And the reference to the sea going over the vessel, the reference to the uh, waves hitting the stern is very pertinent because, of course, it was at the stern of the Princess Victoria that the troubles really started. And it was the opening of the stern doors by the sea, the bursting open of those stern doors and the inability of the crew, despite valiant effort, to get them properly closed again, which uh, was at the crux of this whole disaster. The captain, Captain Ferguson, uh, once he realised the enormity of the storm and had got out into the channel, um, he knew that he could reverse back into Loch Ryan uh, if they used the... the uh, the bow rudder um, and that could be employed which would enable the ship without having to turn around to reverse back into Loch Ryan um, and three seamen were sent to the front of the vessel to try and uh, achieve that unfortunately the seas were so rough and they were coming over the bow of the vessel the captain was concerned that uh, men would be swept overboard and they were unable to get the rudder engaged um, and he called them back uh, into the the uh, relatively safer area. The uh, options for Captain James Ferguson now were narrowed. Uh, he could have reversed into Loch Ryan had that rudder uh, been operative. Uh, 
but his only options really were to try and turn around as uh, the lighthouse keeper at, at Corswell Point believed the ship might have been trying to do. Um, to turn around would bring a risk because it would mean that the sea could uh, breach into the stern of the vessel much quicker and that in fact she could go down very very quickly. Uh, the only other alternative that seemed viable to Captain Ferguson was to run the storm as it was called to get across the channel that narrow sea channel between Scotland and Ulster um, and get his ship uh, across there as uh, safely as possible in as short a time as they could manage and that was effectively the only option that he felt was open to him at that particular time and that is the option that he elected to try and realise. He came very close to achieving that. The vessel went down just a few miles off the mouth of Belfast Loch. In the midst of all of this uh, it would be normal for a ship to uh, send out uh, a message, often an SOS message, to detail that she's in trouble. Uh, a message was then sent from Princess Victoria. It wasn't an SOS, but it did explain uh, that things were not going to plan on this particular voyage. The radio officer that day on the Princess Victoria was David Broadfoot. David Broadfoot had been at sea since 1915 and he was from Stranraer. It's a cruel irony of fate that he wasn't scheduled to be on the ship that day but had come on as a relief radio operator. The message that he sent, the second message he sent from the ship, the first one was to say that they had left uh, the port, but the second message uh, said Hove to off mouth of Loch Ryan, vessel not under command, urgent assistance of tug required. Now that wasn't a standard SOS message, but it was simply saying that there was a problem and the ship was not under control um, and they needed assistance. The other aspect that's uh, interesting in relation to this is that at that time, a lot of ships would have had radio communication. Princess Victoria was still using uh, Morse code communication and not direct radio communication, which made, it made things much more uh, easier to uh, deal with as time went on. One of the early messages fed into this impending disaster because the first coordinates that were sent by the Princess Victoria uh, to say that she was in trouble were uh, slightly wrong and that meant that uh, other vessels, particularly Royal Naval Vessel, coming to uh, the rescue uh, had the wrong coordinates to work off so in every subsequent message from the Princess Victoria those uh, co wrong coordinates at the very beginning uh, fed into this um, and had she had a radio rather than the, the Morse code system then it might have made things a little bit easier. What was used at one point then was uh, called triangulation of the radio signal um, and uh, David Broadfoot continued to send out a signal from the ship which was triangulated uh, from other posts to give an idea of where she actually was because there was no real visibility in the North Channel that day. Uh, there were 30 to 40 foot high waves, uh, blizzard conditions and nothing could be seen very much uh, in the midst of all of that. So the vessels that were trying to search for the Princess Victoria were not going to spot her uh, from a distance and because they didn't know the, the correct coordinates they were looking in the wrong place. Uh, at the start of this search operation. So that didn't help things uh, either. David Broadfoot, as the radio officer, uh, 
continue to send out the messages though and it was his triangulation message that enabled the authorities to realize just exactly where the princess victoria was by that time she was drifting out of control uh, her engines were not functioning um, and she was drifting down the north channel and uh, dear Broadfoot continued to send out these messages his last message was two minutes before the princess victoria went down from his position in the ship where he was manning his post as radio officer he would have known that he could not escape uh, and uh, he went down with the vessel as did the captain james ferguson uh, david broadfoot was later to be awarded posthumously george cross for his efforts to try and save as many lives as possible on that terrible afternoon and other vessels did begin to search for the ferry as i said um, and as that happened on the ship itself must have been pandemonium uh, breaking out from the accounts that we have of the survivors uh, the car deck was very quickly uh, being filled with water the water was coming in to other areas then uh, the stern doors were open so the sea was coming in more and more sea and the weight of that water was very significant uh, things were starting to move around in the cargo decks which added to uh, the plight of this stricken vessel um, and of course the gales uh, were buffeting all the time um, f for all the efforts that were being made to try and um, close doors or try and uh, alleviate the situation anyway uh, all those seamen who were involved in that and all the passengers who were helping out uh, had really the worst of the weather to contend with them in that case as well and the ship uh, began to list she started to list um, Around 10 o'clock in the morning, able seaman John Murdoch uh, reported he could see about half of the car deck covered with water to a depth of about one foot. And the port propeller uh, was raised in the sea uh, because of the, the impact of the, the vessel uh, starting to list. Um, and that made the, the propeller less effective for the vessel as well. Um, and she was veering in the direction that she was lowest in the water, which was the, the starboard side as she moved forward. Now at 11 o'clock Port Patrick lifeboat was launched and set out uh, for a point north west of Corswell Point. Um, on the ship itself uh, passengers were being reassured by announcements. Um, the ship was going through a severe test one said but there is no danger you are quite safe. Um, and shortly after that message crew members started to hand out the life jackets and some of the able seamen began to prepare uh, the lifeboats. By this time a severe list was occurring. Furniture which wasn't secured uh, on the lower lounges was sliding around and walking about on the vessel was becoming very difficult indeed. There was also problems when crew members went to try and make the lifeboats ready. They found that on the starboard side, the boats were touching the water and oars and some of the, the smaller gear inside had already been washed away. The ship uh, began to uh, roll sideways because of the list. The windows in the third class saloon uh, were under the surface of the sea. So all of this must have been a uh, horrifying and terrifying ordeal for the people on board. This would all have happened relatively quickly and there would have been a sense that um, things were not going well, things were not going the right way and there was an imp impending sense, I'm sure, that the ship was in danger of sinking. And uh, the whole conditions around the ship and the storm the waves, mountainous seas, all of that must have terrified uh, people on board uh, if they considered that they were going to end up in lifeboats uh, in the midst of all this as well. And the ship herself continued to drift uh, southwest down the channel. Um, Port Patrick Coast Guard were trying to identify her position, um, uh, had been unable to find her because of these the, the mix up over the coordinates, as I said. And at 12 noon, David Broadfoot transmitted his series of triangulation single letter V's uh, which were used to give a bearing and um, Port Patrick, Princess Victoria and Malin Head uh, 
uh, triangulated the signal so they could identify where in the North Channel uh, the stricken vessel actually was at this point. Um, and it became clear then, once that triangulation occurred, that the Princess Victoria had uh, drifted down the Irish Sea. She drifted down the North Channel uh, and she was 12 miles north northeast of Mew Island, off the Copeland Islands. Um, and that meant, from the point of view of the one of the Royal Navy vessels, HMS Contest, which was uh, on its way to try and rescue her, it meant an additional 45 minutes before it would arrive. And unfortunately, the Princess Victoria didn't have 45 minutes for that to happen. Author Stephen Cameron, in his excellent and detailed book Death in the North Channel, uh, tells us that by this stage things were reaching a critical point. There was a depth of four feet of water on the car deck and around 120,000 gallons of water, which was not draining away, but was uh, seeping deeper into the hull of the vessel, pushing her deeper into the water. The waves were washing over the stern of the ship and that was driving it further into the water as well. The ship was sinking and everyone knew that by this stage. At eight minutes past one, the engine room was flooded. The engine stopped working entirely. Captain Ferguson spoke to the second engineer, a man called John Taylor, to see if they could be restarted for a quick burst because he realised how close the ship now was to the Ulster coast. But he was told that the engine room was too badly flooded for that to happen. Passengers were moved as high as possible uh, on the ship. Some were rescued from the lounge through a broken window to allow them to climb up. But there was no real security at this time for anyone. The car that had been left behind in Loch Ryan on the side of the quay belonged to a man called James Carlin and he and his family uh, were then on the Princess Victoria. He pulled them up to the rails and then went to see if there were any lifeboats nearby. When he returned it was to find that the sea had washed his family away. Cousins William McAllister and William Hooper were both members of the ship's crew and they were clinging to the rails together. Hooper told his cousin, you stay with me and I'll stay with you. But a few seconds later, William Hooper was carried off by a wave. The crew did start to launch the lifeboats, a very difficult operation. The first lifeboat had all the women and children put on board as would be traditional in a situation such as this. But the first lifeboat was slammed against the side of the Princess Victoria by the ferocity of the storm and the waves and all the passengers were thrown into the water. And there were no women or children who survived the Princess Victoria disaster. One man, Ronald McNeil, who was a worker at the Shorts Aircraft Factory in Scotland, saw his wife Nan in the water and dived from the lifeboat he was in to try and save her. And he did reach her, but both of them were then overcome by the waves tragically. One of the lifeboats did launch successfully and most of the people who were rescued were on that lifeboat. A second lifeboat, which only three men managed to get on, was washed up on the County Down coast with all three found dead inside, having died from hypothermia. A 1354, David Broadfoot at his station sent the last message from the Princess Victoria. SOS, estimated position now, five miles east of Copeland's, entrance Belfast Loch. Two minutes later, the Princess Victoria went down. This sad story has many heroes and heroines.
from those on board the ship itself, the crew and the passengers, to those who went in search of them on board the Royal Naval Vessel HMS Contest and on other vessels as well, such as the passive Drumochter, captained by a man from Carnlock, Captain Kelly, who came out of the shelter of Belfast Loch to try and assist those in distress, the Donacadee and the Port Patrick lifeboats, and many others. Of course, the saddest thing about the tragedy is that it could have been avoided. And afterwards, there was an inquiry into what had gone wrong and how it might have been prevented. The inquiry concluded that two significant factors were responsible for the disaster that day. One was the stern doors of the vessel, which were not really designed for the North Channel route, but which did have an, a, a, a guillotine which was brought down, which was a, an engineering effort to uh, alleviate the problem of the stern doors. It clearly was recognised that they were a weakness in the vessel. The guillotine which came down and strengthened those doors, however, was not working that day and had not been working uh, for some days prior to it. So that was one of the factors that the Court of Inquiry highlighted. It also highlighted that there were scuppers on the deck of the car deck and that they were not large enough to drain away any surplus uh, seawater or liquid of any sort. And the court found that tellingly there had been an incident sometime before when a milk tanker had overturned and it was shown quite clearly that those scuppers did not work adequately in draining away the milk from the tanker. So those two findings were key in terms of what went wrong uh, that day in the midst of that terrible gale, a terrible storm. There was an appeal against the decision, but the court upheld its decision, uh, or upheld the decision of the Court of Inquiry in relation to the reason behind this terrible, terrible tragedy. And one of the terrible things, of course, is that all these people on board this ship had just come from so many different backgrounds. They were just crossing a very narrow stretch of sea. And unfortunately, for most of them, they would never get home again. There were a number of different groupings on board that vessel. There was the crew of the Princess Victoria, some of the crew of the Princess Margaret, who were on their way back to Northern Ireland. Also, aircraft workers from a Shorts aircraft factory in Wig Bay, uh, near Stranraer, and uh, other passengers then who were coming across. Most of these people would not be terribly well known without uh, outside outside their own families, without their own families. Uh, but there were two, certainly two prominent individuals, the uh, Finance Minister for Northern Ireland, Maynard Sinclair, who was seen as a rising figure uh, within the political establishment in Northern Ireland and someone who was tipped to have been Prime Minister at some stage. And a colleague, uh, Walter Smiles from North Down, Member of Parliament in Westminster for North Down. So they were two very prominent individuals who were on board uh, the vessel. Both of them were to lose their lives in the disaster. But most people would not be known uh, in a wider stage. Uh, but the heartbreak was no less for them and their families than for uh, the more prominent people. They're all commemorated, of course, whatever their station in life, at the Princess Victoria Memorial on the Lawrence Seafront. And they're also remembered in Stranraer and Port Patrick and Donacha Dee. And this disaster resonated around this coastal basin, which had so close connections over many, many centuries, but nothing of the nature of the tragedy that was to occur 
on January the 31st, 1953. Thanks for joining me for this presentation. I hope that you have found it of interest.